Hydration of an alkene, that'll be the topic of this lesson. And we'll find out that we've got actually three methods to hydrate an alkene. We've got acid catalyzed hydration, we've got oxymercuration, demercuration, and we've got hydroboration oxidation. Now we'll find out that acid catalyzed hydration will go Markovnikov for the regioselectivity and that it does not have any stereoselectivity. We'll also find out that it proceeds through a carbocation intermediate and in some cases is subject to rearrangements. Now, oxymercuration, demercuration, we'll find out also goes Markovnikov, but no carbocation intermediate, no rearrangement. Uh, and if it matters, the stereoselectivity is going to be anti. Finally, hydroboration oxidation, we'll find out uh, this is the one that goes anti Markovnikov, that distinguishes it from the other two uh, for that regioselectivity. And we'll find out that if it matters, the stereoselectivity is sin. But again, no carbocation intermediate and therefore not subject to rearrangements. Now this is part of my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, the next reaction we'll take a look at is acid catalyzed hydration. Now we'll call it hydration because we're going to add water across the alkene. We'll add an H and an OH. But it turns out water and alkenes don't react very well together, so water is not the greatest electrophile, but if you put acid in there to catalyze it, so you get a much better electrophile H3O+, as it turns out. Now the reagent here is just going to be uh, H2SO4 that is dilute. And so sometimes we'll write this a couple of different ways. Instead of writing H2SO4 that's dilute, some people will write H2SO4 and water, some people will just simply write H3O+. They're all correct. No matter which of these three ways you see it represented, it all means the same thing, acid catalyzed hydration. Now it turns out this is not the only way we carry out the hydration reaction. So we add H and OH across the alkene again. There's actually three different reactions that we can use to accomplish this. This is the first one, and they all have their differences, and we'll emphasize all of those here shortly. Cool, but acid catalyzed hydration here, so and I'll choose to write H3O plus, one of the ways we can represent it. And so in this case, there's your product. We add an H to the less substitute side, the OH to the more substitute side. It does go through a carbocation and had you drawn out your carbocation intermediate, so you'd realize it's not gonna rearrange and stuff like that, so, but there's our product. Adds H and OH, H on the less substitute side, OH on the more substitute side, that's Markovnikov addition. And in this case, we did not form any chiral centers, which is why we would get just the one achiral product. Cool, so that's just predicting product. We haven't even shown the mechanism yet, and you guys know how to predict the product. So, but we definitely need to understand the mechanism, and it's very similar to the, the mechanism with HBr here. All right, so regardless of how you write it, whether you write H2SO4 in water, dilute H2SO4, H3O+, you should realize that H2SO4 being a strong acid dissociates completely to form H3O+. And water, again, is not a good electrophile, but H3O+, is. And so in step one of every alkene reaction we know, the alkene is the nucleophile. You should definitely know that, which makes H3O+, here, the electrophile. And so our alkene's gonna come and grab an H, which can only have one bond, so the old one breaks. And one more time here, I'll draw that H in. That H ends up on the less substituted side of the alkene. That way you get the more substituted and more stable carbocation intermediate. Cool, you also formed a water molecule here as well, which is not the biggest deal in the world because your solution is dilute H2SO4 and is chock full of water molecules. But we did form one, we should keep track of it. It's also gonna be involved in the next step. Now in the last reaction, in addition to the carbocation, we had a bromide ion. And the carbocation we identified as electron poor, and therefore a good electrophile. So, but we had Br minus, which we identified as a good nucleophile. Well, we got water in this case, and water doesn't have a negative formal charge, and he's not a great nucleophile, as we learned when we we're doing substitution reactions. So, but he'll do in this case. He does have a lone pair of electrons, so he actually can act as a nucleophile. But the carbocation, having no filled octet, positive formal charge, so highly reactive, water will do. And we've seen water react as a nucleophile with carbocations back when we did SN1 reactions. And so water's gonna come attach here. Giving us this lovely species here. 
And this lovely species with a positive formal charge on oxygen, so is a very good acid, just like H3O plus is a very strong acid. So very analogous. So as we saw with SN1 reactions, when a neutral nucleophile comes and attacks, it ends up with a positive formal charge. And just like we often did there when water or alcohol is attacked, you bring in another molecule of your solvent to deprotonate, to do a proton transfer so that you don't end up with a positive formal charge on your product. And so in this case, we'll just draw in another water molecule. Our solution again is chock full of them. Cool, and that forms us our product, again, which is a chiral. And we also form some H3O+, the good hallmark of a true catalyst. It is not consumed in the reaction. And so we used up a molecule, or add, in this case, ion of H3O+, to begin with, and then we formed one before the reaction was done. It's not consumed, just as a catalyst shouldn't be. Cool. That is our mechanism. It looks very similar to HBr, with just one extra proton transfer step at the end. Our next alkene addition reaction is oxymercuration, demercuration, and it is also a hydration reaction. It still adds H and OH across an alkene. So it also goes Markovnikov. Now you see the big difference though, is that it does not go through a carbocation intermediate. And so it's never, you never have to worry about rearrangement. It's never gonna happen. So with acid catalyzed hydration, if there's a favorable rearrangement, the major products form through it. Oxymercuration, demercuration, there are never rearrangements. All right, so your reagents here are mercuric acetate with water in the first step, followed by sodium borohydride in the second step. And you'll notice we've got this sequential listing of steps, and that's super important. If you forget to write the one and the two, it is technically wrong. And the idea is that it, it gives us that it's sequential here. So to our alkene, we're first going to add mercuric acetate and water. We're going to let that react. We're going to purify the result of that first step. And then we're going to take that purified result and add sodium borohydride. If you forget to write the one and the two, it just means you added all the reagents at the same time to your alkene, in which case you're not going to get the desired product. So, but in this case, we're still adding H and OH. The H added on the less substitute side of the alkene, the OH added on the more substitute side of the alkene, and that again is Markovnikov addition. All right, so let's take a look at the mechanism of this reaction. So it turns out the name actually comes from the mechanism. In step one, we do oxymercuration, and it turns out we're gonna add an oxygen and a mercury. In step two, we do demercuration, so you lose the mercury, and it turns out it gets replaced with a hydrogen. That's where this kind of comes from. And so let's take a look at step one here. So it turns out that the mercuric acetate dissociates to a small extent here to form a couple of ions. So, and you've got a nice positively charged mercury here, which is an amazing electrophile. Not only does it have a positive formal charge, but it's a metal. It's low in electronegativity. And the alkene, as we've said, is the nucleophile in step one of all the mechanisms we know. And he's got an amazing electrophile to react with. So in the solution. Cool. Now, if we look at what we think is about to happen based on everything we've learned, we're going to find out it's going to be a little bit different. But let's just predict what we think should happen based on everything we've done. So we think we're about to come and attack mercury. So, and this is, might be where you uh, uh, take some notes offset because I'm going to race this in a little bit. So, and we think, oh, hey, we're going to bond to mercury here. I'll draw this off to the side way over here. And we'll attach to that mercury on that less substituted side. So, and form a carbocation. But you might remember we said that we don't form a carbocation in this reaction. And so this is not apparently what's happening. And so mercury's like, hey, 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 slow down. Let's not form this carbocation. Because you know what? I don't have the limitations hydrogen did. When you bonded to hydrogen, Mr. Alkene, before, he didn't have any electrons, but I'm a big fat metal and I got lots of electrons. And so I'm willing, just because I like you, to form another bond to you as well. And so I'll bond to both of you carbons. That way, everybody's got a filled octet and life is good. And that's actually what happens. So it turns out our intermediate here is not a carbocation. Our intermediate has a three-membered ring with mercury, and mercury still has a positive formal charge. We call this a mercurinium ion, if I can spell that correctly. 
So when you see a word ending with I-U-M in chemistry here, so know that you've got a cation, a positive charge, like hydronium, H3O+, ammonium, NH4+, mercurinium here with a positive formal charge. And so our major intermediate, again, not a carbocation, it's a mercurinium ion, and you never have to worry about rearrangements. So, but to draw this, it's probably easiest to show if we redraw that mercury off over here a little bit. We'll show its lone pair of electrons here. And so your alkene is gonna come and attack and attach to the mercury, and your mercury is gonna come and attach back, forming that three-membered ring. And so this is how we typically represent it so that it's a little easier to see exactly what's going on. Cool. So now we've got this lovely three-membered ring intermediate and no carbocation. And in the next step is where water gets involved. And so water is not a great nucleophile. So, and just like an acid catalyzed hydration where water attacks a carbocation, water is going to be attacking this mercurinium ion. The question is where? Well, it's going to be one of the two carbons bonded to mercury because they're both sharing a little bit of that positive charge by both induction or resonance you might even consider. But induction is usually how we present it. So the question is, which one's more positively charged? Well, whichever one would be more stable as a carbocation also can handle more of the partial positive charge. And that's the secondary carbon here not the primary one here. Having more partial positive charge, it would be uh, have a lower activation energy if water attacks there. He's more attracted there, another way to look at it. And so that's where water it come, turns out is gonna come and attack. So, but we've seen something a little bit different here. We're attacking this three-membered ring and we're attacking that carbon specifically. This is the first time in this chapter we've attacked an sp3 hybridized carbon. In every other case so far, it's been we've been attacking an sp2 hybridized carbocation. Well, when you attack an sp3 carbon, as you learned in the chapter on SN2, it's backside attack, totally still backside attack here. So if it matters, it will eventually. That's why it's gonna end up being anti uh, stereo selectivity because we have to do backside attack when we attack this three membered ring, this mercurinium ion. All right, so in this case, your mercury is still bonded on the less substitute side, but now you've got a water molecule bonded on the more substitute side. And just like we did in acid catalyzed hydration when the water attached to the carbocation, a neutral nucleophile attacks and you end up with a positive formal charge and another molecule of your solvent, in this case water, will come and deprotonate. All right. Technically, I guess we formed some H3O+. All right, so this is the mechanism for the first synthetic step in the reaction. So, and there's a little confusion on exactly what's happening in the second step, at least the exact mechanism. And so that's a freebie for you. You get out of having to know the mechanism for the second step. If we're unsure about it, well, then you don't have to know it. Life is good. And so for step one, that mechanism is totally on you. And notice we had one, two, three steps in that mechanism. But step two is sodium bar hydride. That's where demercuration takes place. You have to know what happens, but you don't have to know the arrow pushing for it at all. And so when we add the sodium borohydride, it simply replaces that mercury with a hydrogen. Demercuration. Cool. And there's our final product. And this example, again, I didn't form any chiral centers. And so we just get the one achiral product as we've seen be the case before. All right, our next alkene addition reaction here is hydroboration oxidation. So here are reagents here. So BH3 is borane. So like methane is CH4, BH3 is borane. And it turns out we complex it with tetrahydrofuran here. So BH3, boron's notorious for not having a filled octet. So the tetrahydrofuran actually will bond to it uh, in kind of a quasi bond and kind of temporarily give it a filled octet to make it a little more stable. Now, technically though, the reaction can be done without tetrahydrofuran, just plain old borane. So, but it turns out borane will commonly dimerize. And so you typically see that first step written as B2H6 instead. But the second step's gonna involve peroxide under basic conditions. So H2O2 and NaOH, either way. So, and again, the most common way you're gonna see it here is BH3 complex with tetrahydrofuran, but you might see it this way. So just a word to the wise.
All right, so this is also hydration. It still adds an H and an OH. It adds water across an alkene, but this time it goes anti-Markovnikov. And so in this case, the H ends up on the more substitute side and the OH on the less substitute side backwards of what we saw with both acid catalyzed hydration and oxymercuration demercuration. Cool, now this is also again two mechanistic, I'm sorry, two synthetic steps, so steps in synthesis. And just like with oxymercuration, you're probably gonna be on the hook for the mechanism of step one, but not for step two. Now we do know the mechanism for step two, but it's long, it involves radicals, and it might be a little complicated for the typical uh, OCHEM 1 student. So most professors, most textbooks let you off the hook. So if on the odd chance you're on the hook for this one, it's on my website, chadsprep.com, you can find it there. All right, but let's take a look at the mechanism for step one because that you are on the hook for. So take a look here. In fact, you know, I'm gonna flip this around so it's a little easier to see when we're drawn out this mechanism. All right, so our alkene here is gonna line up with BH3. And like we've said in the first step of every mechanism we know for these alkene addition reactions, the alkene is the nucleophile. Great. And so BH3 is the electrophile. And a lot of students think, oh, attack a hydrogen. Not true in this case. You have something better than hydrogen. You have a highly electron deficient boron with no filled octet, big fat empty P orbital, amazing electrophile. And so your alkene is actually going to come and attack boron. And just like we've seen before, whatever the nucleophile, I'm sorry, whatever the alkene attacks, ends up on the less substituted side. It's gonna end up on this less substituted carbon, but it turns out simultaneously, this boron hydrogen bond breaks and reattaches to the other carbon. Cool. So I'm gonna save a little room and you should too on your notes. But what we end up with here is this lovely species here, where boron, which had three hydrons, now only has two, and its third hydrogen is now attached to this sp3 carbon here. So if you notice, when, it, when this carbon was sp2 hybridized, it only has one hydrogen. Now it has two, it gained a new one. Cool. So, and the reason we had you save a little room here, well, this, I mean, this is, this is the whole mechanism. I'm like, it's just one step. So, and that's too easy. And so oftentimes we say, well, you know what? <laughs> Let's make the students draw a transition state for this one, just to make it a little longer. So you're on the hook for drawing a transition state typically. So transition state has all bonds that are being broken and formed as partial bonds. And so in this case, we have a partial bond to boron, a partial pi bond being broken. So a partial bond to hydrogen also being broken, but forming a new bond between carbon and hydrogen right here. And so you end up, well, let's make that a little cleaner. But you end up with a transition state in which you've got kind of a four-membered ring for all the bonds that are being broken and formed. So, cool. We also use this to explain why this ends up as a syn addition, though. So it turns out the two things we're adding here, boron and hydrogen, have to add to the same side of the alkene, either both from the front or both from the back. So because they're coming from exactly the same molecule, they're right next to each other. They were bonded together. And so they have to add to the same side. And that's what's gonna be characteristic of a couple of our syn additions, is you add two atoms at the same time to your alkene from the same molecule. And so they have to add to the same side. Cool. So here our alkene is reacted with BH3 and we end up with it bonded to BH2. This is the hydroboration. We added a hydrogen and a boron. Hydrogen on one side, boron on the other side. Now it turns out boron had three hydrogens to begin with. Now he's only got two. So every time he reacts with an alkene, he loses a hydrogen. Well, he's still got two left. And so it turns out this process repeats itself two more times. and reacts with two more alkenes, forming, in this case, what's called a trialkyl borane. And that is actually the true intermediate at the end of your synthesis step number one right here. Cool. And this is typically, again, the entire mechanism you're on the hook for, for most OCHEM 1 classes. So for synthesis step number two here with peroxide and sodium hydroxide, so again, I've seen once in 20 years, students be on the hook from their professor for this, but so I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just not likely. 
And for most of you, all you really need to know though, is that when we add peroxide and sodium hydroxide here, that we're gonna break every single carbon borane bond, carbon boron bond, I should say. And in this case, just replace them all with an OH. But rather than drawing three of these, you're just gonna draw one because they're all the same thing. So regardless of how you look at it. So we'll just draw one, I'll take the other two away. And we just essentially get three of these, but from three alkenes. Cool, and that's your final product. We added an H to the more substitute side, the OH to the less substitute side. It went anti-Markovnikov. Where we added the H, so not a chiral center, and where we added the OH, not a chiral center, with no chiral centers formed, we just get the one achiral product. There's your mechanism. Cool, so we've covered three different hydration reactions now. So, and I wanna compare and contrast with one uh, strategic example. All right, our strategic example here is gonna be this lovely alkene here. And uh, we've got acid catalyzed hydration, oxymercuration, demercuration, and hydroboration oxidation. The top two both go Markovnikov, the bottom one here is anti-Markovnikov, but between the top two, the first acid catalyzed hydration is subject to rearrangements because it goes through a carbocation. And so in this case, we should definitely draw, okay, what would the carbocation look like if we did go through one? So, and in this case, it would look, we'd add the H right there, and end up with the more substituted, more stable carbocation. But even so, it's still just a secondary carbocation. And the adjacent carbon on the right is not more stable, but the one on the left was a tertiary carbon and is. And so as a result, we are gonna do a hydride shift. And so we'll draw in the relevant hydrogen and just transfer him over to this carbon. That way this carbon gets a filled octet, but this carbon will now be missing a bond and will now be the carbocation in the next structure. Cool. And there we get our tertiary carbocation and none of the adjacent carbons are any more stable than that. It's not gonna rearrange anymore. So, and that's ultimately where water is going to attack and where the OH ends up in the product. And so in this case, there's our product. So undergoing a rearrangement. Now, had we done this with uh, mercuric acetate instead, deoxymercuration, demercuration, then we would have never had the chance for a rearrangement. So and we would have just simply added the H to the less substitute side, the OH to the more substitute side. And if we do this with hydroboration oxidation, then it goes anti-Markovnikov, and we'll add the OH to the less substitute side, the H to the more substitute side. Cool, but we should take and examine these products a little further and see how many chiral centers we formed. So we added an H here, not a chiral center, in the rearrangement, we actually add another H here. He's now newly sp 3 hybridized, but still not a chiral center. And this is where the OH added, and he's got two identical methyls, and he's not a chiral center. And since we didn't form any chiral centers, we don't have any stereochemistry to show, we get one achiral product. But for the next one here, so where the H added, it's not a chiral center, but where the OH added, that is indeed a chiral center. And if you form one chiral center, you do indeed get two products. And so technically here, we probably should have drawn this out like so. Show that racemic mixture. And then finally with hydroboration oxidation, we didn't form any chiral centers here either. So where we added the H on the more substitute side, not a chiral center. Where we added the OH, also not a chiral center. And we get just this one achiral product. Cool, so great example to show you the difference between the three different hydration reactions. So much of the time acid catalyzed hydration and oxymercuration demercuration will give you the same product, provided there's no favorable rearrangement. But when there is like this, you can definitely see the difference in the products they produce. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems, whether it be quizzes or chapter tests or practice final exams, check out my premium courses on chadsprep.com.